I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2. You know what Acts chapter 2 records without looking? What does it record? It records the, the fulfillment of the Jewish feast of Pentecost. But you know what the most amazing thing is about Acts chapter 2? It's the part that people skip. And it's this. There is a real connection between Acts chapter 2 and Genesis 11, the record of the Tower of Babel. In fact, a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning, I preached a message called The Holy War. And in that message, I concluded by suggesting that Pentecost was actually a reversal of Babel. And there are two main ways that that is true. You're in Acts chapter 2, and I wanted you to note verse uh, 5 to begin with. It says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, notice this, out of every nation under heaven. And then if you'll drop down in this chapter to verse 10, he, uh, he names different countries that were represented and also strangers or foreigners of Rome, Jews, and notice this, proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles, people from the nations that were non-Jewish, but that were, that were converting, you might say, to Judaism. And uh, so I want you to see this, especially that phrase in verse 5, out of every nation. Multiple nations were present on the day of Pentecost. And each of these nations had their national language. And all of these nations are mentioned in verses 9, 10, and 11. And all of these nations, you must understand, are nations that were disinherited by God when he divided the nations in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. And there's a second thing that connects to the Tower of Babel in, in uh, this record of Pentecost. If you look at verse number six, it says, Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You know, in Genesis 11, and verse 7, God says, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. The word confound in Genesis eleven seven, 7, in the Greek translation of uh, the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures, that word confound is the same word that is translated confounded in Acts 2 and verse 6. And interestingly enough, God confounded the language of the nations in Genesis 11. But in Acts 2, he brought understanding to the people so that they understood languages that they, uh, and spoke languages that they had not studied. And so this is really a contrast. As I said a moment ago, Pentecost is actually the reversal of the Tower of Babel. And so I want to pause a moment, have a word of prayer, and then I want to share some thoughts that I hope will, it, it really is a sequel to that message that I preached a couple of weeks ago uh, to the Holy War. And if you forget what that was about, go back and listen to it on YouTube or whatever. But this is, this is big picture stuff. This is, this is stuff that when you understand this, it's just heart thrilling to see the magnificent plan that God enacted and is still working out. And guess what? We're a part of it. And he wants to use us 
we can partner with him in getting this task completed. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful to be able to have the scripture and that you revealed this this, uh, truth to us. It's just amazing. And Lord, only you could come up with such a remarkable, just mind-boggling plan that even confounded the uh, the unseen, the spirits in the unseen realm. They couldn't figure it out. Had they figured it out, they would never have crucified Jesus. So we're just so thankful for your wonderful wisdom and your works to the children of men and uh, to us. And so, Lord, tonight, Spirit of God, would you anoint us with understanding that we might get from this passage this evening precisely what you intend us to understand and uh, to really take to heart. And may it motivate us. May the love of Christ constrain us to preach Christ, to take the gospel as we've sung about tonight, to tell the story, to proclaim the good news of what salvation is all about. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard of the Great Commission, right? You know, the Great Commission is actually in all four Gospels, but it's actually repeated a fifth time in the book of Acts. You know, Luke wrote the Gospel. Luke, obviously. But remember, Luke also wrote Acts. And in Acts, uh, uh, he talks about that the Gospel, Jesus says, was to go starting in Judea, and then into Samaria, and then uh, unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the Great Commission, you might say, in uh, Acts chapter 1. Well, Acts chapter 2 is really the commission as it's given to this church that was just birthed by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Before we look uh, there in Acts 2, I want to jump back into Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, there is recorded what is called the table of nations. There are 70 nations that are listed in Genesis chapter 10. These are the Gentile nations. These are the nations that that God uh, uh, divided and disinherited at the Tower of Babel. And these 70 nations, of course, we know there's a lot more nations now, and there may have been more than 70 then, but what you need to understand is the 70 nations that are listed in Genesis 10 represent in that world, in the ancient Near East, that was the known world when this book was written. And I want to put up a map here uh, that uh, gives a little bit of a picture of the location of these nations in uh, Genesis chapter 10. Uh, Nations from the east uh, to the west, uh, from Mesopotamia, I don't know if if that is actually on here, but it's this area here uh, that is called Asia. That's actually uh, where Mesopotamia uh, existed. And uh, the nations, this is this is the cradle of civilization uh, in the Bible and in history as well. And it moves from the east towards the west. And this is the farthest point west. Tarshish. And in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 4, where we have a uh, a listing of the sons of Japheth, one of the three sons of Noah. After the flood, these three boys, their descendants repopulated the earth, right? Because everyone was wiped out by the flood. Well, one of the sons was Japheth, and uh, One of his sons' name is Tarshish. What you find in the Bible is often the names of geographical places are the names of people. 
that uh, that settled those particular areas. And so Genesis 10:4 talks about Tarshish way over here in the west. And so it it all begins here and it spreads westward. And that's the known world in uh, in the ancient Near East. And beyond Tarshish, there may have been more, but to them it was unknown. Uh, this is that's as far as as they migrated that they knew of. Okay. Now, with that in mind, let's go over to Acts chapter two again. And in Acts chapter two, um, remember that verse where Jesus told his disciples, you're going to begin in Jerusalem here, but then you're going to spread to from the city to uh, the country of Judea and then to that neighboring country, Samaria. And then you're going to spread to the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1.8. You'll be my witnesses. Remember, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses to the uttermost part of the earth. This is the Great Commission. And uh, in chapter 2 of Acts, in verses 9, 10, and 11, we have a list of nations. It says in that first, uh, that fifth verse, that in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, there were Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And then the nations that they come from are listed there, 9, 10, and 11 of Acts chapter 2. That represents the known world of that day. That represents, those nations represent the extent of what was the Roman Empire. The list in Acts 2 connects with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and of course, then the commissioning of the apostles, it all happens here. And after that, the rest of the book of, of Acts is the, the commissioning and the spreading of the gospel through these apostles. Uh, the list begins really at the farthest point east, and then uh, where the Jewish population was. And then you see, as you look at these nations listed, it spreads uh, progressively westward, westward, moving through Mesopotamia. In fact, we have the next map up. Okay. So the Parthian Empire really was the Persian Empire. Um, you know, Iran is uh, ancient to Persia. A modern Iran, that area, Mesopotamia here. So this is where it starts uh, it, it here in Jerusalem, and then it spreads eastward. And then when the, the apostles are sent out, especially the apostle Paul, they spread westward. And uh, of course, Paul ends up in prison in Rome. But uh, that's not where it stops. In fact, there is a, um, there's really a southern fork or branch of, of the outreach and then a northern branch. Paul takes that northern branch into uh, uh, what was called Asia Minor and Turkey today and into Italy, uh, Greece and Italy. But uh, there was others that went on a southern, southerly route into North Africa, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Cyrene is North Africa, Ethiopia, uh, Libya. They're all mentioned in, this, uh, in these verses in Acts chapter 2. And I think what we should understand is that, remember, there was also people that were in Jerusalem. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch, for example. He was there, uh, and as a result, he took the gospel back to North Africa, to Ethiopia. And uh, so these 3,000 that are saved on the day of Pentecost, uh, they're, they're mentioned uh, down in, I think, uh, like verse uh, 41. It talks about 3,000 people that are saved on the day of Pentecost. These 3,000 people, they returned to their homeland with the gospel, and uh, they be begin to plant the gospel seeds for the first time. And my point is this. 
what I'm trying to say is that this is the 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 spirit of God using these saved people to reclaim the nations that were divided and disinherited at the Tower of Babel. Acts ends in the city of Rome. The 28th chapter of Acts, the last chapter, Paul's under house arrest in Rome. However, I don't think that's where Paul's ministry ends as far as going west. Turn over to Romans chapter 15 for a moment with me. And in Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 22, you can follow along as I read down to verse 28. Here's what Paul says to the, to the Roman believers. For which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you for I trust to see you in my journey and be brought on my way thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem and minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor believers which are at Jerusalem. It pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the nations have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Notice this again. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Two times he talks about going to Spain. Now, this tells me that Paul not only has a commission, but Paul has a comprehension. Paul is conscious that uh, his mission for Christ involves him spreading the gospel farther westward than even Rome, because Spain is west of Rome. And uh, notice the direction that he is giving here, that uh, the reversing of Babel and the reclaiming of these disinherited nations that took place then in, includes going farther west than the city of Rome. The westernmost of the disinherited nations at Babel, according to the table of nations there in Genesis chapter 10, is Tarshish. And Tarshish is Spain, which makes sense. Paul comprehended that it was God's plan and he told the Romans that I am planning to go to Spain. He was going to the Tarshish of his day because he had that comprehension. And so with that direction from God, he had a determination. He was termed the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was. He was the apostle, you might say, to the disinherited nations. And he realized that for him to finalize his mission, he had to reach the most Western part known to them. And that was Tarshish. That was Spain. Uh, and uh, that was, of course, his part in reversing Babel. Now, go back to Romans 11 with me. Here's Paul again. Because he, he has this commission, he has this comprehension, and so he wants to bring it to completion. And in Romans 11, and I, I shared this on Sunday afternoon in our, in our PM Bible study, we talked about Gentile fullness. I explained that in detail, what that meant. So I'm not going to do that today. But uh, I want to turn your attention to those two verses, 25 and 26, where Paul says, I would not have you, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. 
Paul realized that in his commission and in the reversing of Babel, if you will, that it necessitated Gentile fullness. That is, God reclaiming the nations, the Gentile nations. God infusing into the nations spiritual life and blessing that would then bring restoration to Israel, as verse 26 says. So Paul was intent on reaching this completion. The reason that Paul focused in, in, in Romans 15 on getting to Spain, going to Spain, is because I'm convinced Paul believed himself to be God's vessel to bring spiritual blessing to the nations that would result in Gentile spiritual privilege. You know, as it was prophesied by Noah, that uh, the Gentiles would dwell in the tents of Shem. That is, the Jews would be a blessing to the nations of this world. And Paul knew that, he comprehended that, and he wanted to do his part in bringing this to completion, that people would be saved out from among the nations of the world. They would be enriched with God's spiritual blessings so that it would result in the Jews wanting what they see in the Gentile believers, which would set up Israel then for its restoration that is promised in verse 26. See how it all fits together? So that's why Paul is so intent on going to Spain, on going as far west as he possibly, to reach Tarshish, to reach that, uh, the, that the last of the nations, to reclaim them. And I wonder where Paul got that, where he got that insight. Well, I think he may have gotten it from Isaiah chapter 66. And you can turn there if you want, but I'm going to read verses 18 to 21. Isaiah chapter 66, these verses really detail missionary witness all the way to Tarshish, all the way to Spain that will take place in God reclaiming the nations. Listen to this. For I, uh, he says, I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that, look, look at this, I will gather what? All nations. I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish. There it is. And other nations that, of course, uh, refer to the, the area in the Straits of Gibraltar, northern Africa. <clears throat> Those that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and chariots, in litters, upon mules, swift beasts, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. I think this is where Paul got his insight. The farthest west point in Pentecost was Rome. But Paul knew, based on Isaiah 66, that Tarshish had to be reached with the gospel. Spain, that was part of the mission. And with that insight, he was intent on completing his mission and finishing his course. And I think, although it's not recorded in our New Testament, I think Paul got to Spain. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have finished my course. And I think he really did finish his course. And all this begins, when you think about it, with a bunch of Jewish people that have a direct commission from the Holy Spirit and are empowered through the Holy Spirit 
who went out and started uh, proclaiming to the disinherited nations, bringing them back into God's family, and eventually it will end in all the nations being brought together into God's family. And you know what God's plan is for this earth? He's going to renew it. He's going to renovate it so that the whole earth will be like a global Eden. That's God's ultimate plan for this uh, the planet we live on. It's still God's plan. From Jerusalem to the nations and then back to Jerusalem full circle. I guess I want to just close with this. What part do you and I play in all of this? I mean, how does this apply to us? Well, I think it, it's very important that we see that we have the privileged opportunity of really partnering with God. So many of these nations are right here in New York City. It's just a, amazing. And we have the, the opportunity to evangelize them. I'm reminded of a famous violinist, violinist by the name of, of Fritz Chrysler. He made a fortune with his concerts and his compositions, but he was a very generous man, and he gave a lot of his money, most of it actually, away. On one of his trips, he came across a very um, exquisite violin, but because he had given so much money away, he couldn't afford to buy it. So he he saved and earned the money and returned to the seller. But when he got there, he was informed by the seller that a collector had already bought it. It wasn't available. Well, he tracked down the collector. He went to his place and uh, he said, I would like to buy this violin from you. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but the violin has become a very prized possession of mine and I don't want to sell it. So he turned away disappointed, but as he was walking away, a thought came to him and he turned back to the, to the, uh, the collector. And he said, look, he said, could I just play the instrument one more time before it's consigned to silence? And he said, sure. Well, and he played that violin, the room was just filled with such beautiful music that it moved the heart of this collector. And his emotions were so deeply stirred. He said, you know what? He said, I don't really have a right to keep this violin to myself. It's yours. Take it into the world and let the people hear it. Well, you know, we have no right to keep the gospel to ourselves. We have to take it into the world and let the people hear it. When we have our 25th uh, anniversary and have this big block party out here, let's pray that God would bring people from all over the world uh, to our block. Let's pray that God would bring people out of their houses in our neighborhood, that uh, we would have an opportunity to evangelize them. Let's partner with God on a daily basis to just be witnesses and take the gospel to people that we work with, people that we do business with, uh, people that we live with, and people that we rub shoulders with. And just understand the marvelous plan. And what a privilege it is to just partner with God in it, isn't it? This is what it's about. This is what God's doing. He's trying to bring the nations back that he had to disinherit at the Tower of Babel. But that wasn't to be permanent. He wants them in his family again, in his household of faith. And he uses us. We're his hands and feet. We're his mouth uh, to preach the gospel, to bring them in. And I hope that you will. I hope that you'll use every opportunity that God gives.